the business cycle, or the kitchen cycle. One of the better known cycles is the business cycle, or kitchen cycle. Joseph Kitchen, 1861 to 1932, labelled this a non-fixed cycle lasting between three and five years. This is a very old and well-established theory, so I thought it would be worth researching this phenomenon in depth. As usual, I'll be, I will be using the S&P 500 index for this comparison, as the index is broad enough to be representative and the data is accurate and easily available to all. To do this analysis, I first mapped the actual yearly return of the S&P 500 index from the first trading Monday of the calendar year to the last trading day. So let's first of all clarify this chart. This is a chart of the performance for an entire calendar year. So from the first trading day to the last trading day. Here across the middle, you can see the years from 1950 to 2009. And here you can see the performance. So you can see here if the S&P 500 is making 10% loss for that year, 20, 30% loss, 40% loss, or making a return, a positive return, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% for that year. It's an interesting way to look at an index via a bar chart as opposed to a line chart. So what we see here uh, is Let's take, for example, 1950, the S&P made a gain of over 20% here, as you can see right here, and made a gain in 1951, 1952, made a loss in 1953, and then a huge gain in 1954. And on it goes throughout the years all the way to 2009. The first thing that stands out to me when I created this chart was the number of years registering a higher than 10% gain, 27 out of the 60 years measured here, so 45%. So if you're a buy and hold personality, you would have a 45% chance of a 10% plus year if you had a market index tracking fund. So we can see here's the 10% mark. See how many of the years were higher than a 10% return. Also, the number of years registering lower than a 10% loss was 9 out of 60, or 50%, as you can see here, or 15%, as we can see here. However, we did have 17 losing years during this period, around about 28.3% of the time. This means that you were, would have had a winning year 71% of the time. It would be wonderful to not have your money in the market during those losing years. Imagine what that would do for your net portfolio worth. This will be very much the focus in later chapters. I will drive home the skills you need to be able to listen to what the market is telling you so you will know when not to be invested in stocks or funds. This will make an incredible difference to your profits, even if you're a buy and hold investor. So how do we apply cyclical analysis to this data? I converted this to a line chart and counted the number of years between the peak market returns. So you can see here on this chart, the mapping. So we have from 1950 to the peak in 1953 of five years. Then the next peak is 1957 of four years, and then the next peak three years, as you can see here. And this is how we have a look at the cycle itself. And we can see from peak to peak, five years, four years, three, two, four, five, three, five, three, two, etc., etc., all the way through. And for the troughs, you can see here also 
four years, three years, two, five, three, etc., all the way along. So therefore, we're now starting to evaluate the cycles actually in the marketplace, in the returns, the peak returns of the marketplace during this period. And we see the peaks average for this period for the S&P 500 from 1950 to 2009, exactly four years. And the average number between the troughs is also exactly four years. I mean, the chances of that were pretty slim. This is original work that I've done here. So that was quite surprising to me, the fact that it met exactly four years. And you can count these up and do your own calculations. You don't necessarily need to believe me, but that is pretty impressive. So it seems that this business cycle is still relevant over a 100 years after its inception. We can clearly see that here. Yes, there are areas where it's very much out of phase of the four-year phase. So um, throughout the 90s, there was certainly lots of gains. And here, between 1997 and the, the next peak after that was six years. And, of course, the next peak after that was uh, essentially here also, um, or at least the next surge was uh, in 2009. So you can see here the numbers going a little bit out of phase in eight and six years. But on the whole, this is a very reliable cycle for us to look at. We should be able to build that into our overall conceptualization of how the market moves. The cycles here are clear. But this still needs further analysis. In the following chart, I think you'll find the outcome absolutely fascinating. I've mapped a four-year cycle over the top of this chart, and now we'll be able to see how often the cycle is in phase. This means how often the cycle was absolutely accurate, and how often the cycle was slightly out of phase with what the market actually did. So here we have another chart. This is the exact same chart as you saw before, but with the theoretical four-year wave mapped over the top of it. So here you can see this dotted black wave line is the four-year wave, which hits a, its a peak to peak every four years, starting 1953 with the trough, and then following on all the way to the 2000. This is exactly mapped to four years, and now we bet this enables us to see how accurate the four-year business cycle actually is, and therefore how actionable it is. So what is fascinating about this chart are the four-year cycle peaks. 47% of the time, the four-year cycle predicted peak market returns accurately for that exact year. The wave peak was also accurate, or one year out, 80% of the time. In 93% of the cases of the wave peaking, did the S&P make positive returns. So let's take a look here. So we started the theoretical four-year wave here, and here you can see the peak stock market returns. So in 19... 54, you can see here, 1955, you can see a peak of 48% return there. And then exactly on the trough of the wave, we saw a negative market return. And here, one year out, we can see the theoretical wave here and the actual market return here. And we see that this is slightly out right here. But then the following four-year cycle exactly predicted the peak market return here and here. This was one year out from peak market return. We expected that the theory would have said 1971, but it was actually 1972. However, you can see the, the market, the trough here in the cycle was also one year out. Very interesting. Then the four-year cycle exactly predicted here in 19. 75 peak market returns and exactly predicted the uh, negative returns there in 1977. 
You can see here we had a, a double gain year here in 1978, 1979, and then 1980 was a, a very good period. And that coincided right on the middle of the cycle here. The following peak market return for the four year cycle was here, predicted accurately, and followed by uh, a slightly negative uh, year here, but hardly worth mentioning. And here you can see that at this peak, there was still a positive return for the market for that year. So not necessarily uh, an incorrect prediction. The four year cycle here was one year out, the uh, loss of 10% on the S&P uh, in 1990 was one year later than the four year cycle predicted. But the market certainly made up for that with coinciding exactly correctly uh, in 1991 for the peak returns. And uh, also you can see here the two highest return years in the surging 90s was here exactly predicted by the four year cycle and that continued on for 1987 1990 was also still a very positive year and you can see here for the trough of the cycle you can see there was less positive return but that was a raging bull market at the time here you can see also in 2000 the bottom of the four year cycle coincided here and that was actually uh, exactly the time of the crash of the dot com crash and you can see here there and there were the were the really the the lowest periods of the pullback from the dot com uh, tech bubble 2000 to 2003 coincided exactly with the bottom of the four year cycle and here you can see peak market returns for early 2000 was exactly here predicted by the four year cycle and there was a pullback here so to recap what I was saying earlier, 47% of the time the four year cycle predicted the peak market returns accurately. The wave peak was also accurate or one year out 80% of the time. And in 93% of the cases of the wave peaking did the S&P make positive returns. 93% of the time it made a positive return. That is a very impressive statistic. So you can see here exactly on this peak here of the cycle, you can see nearly every single peak except one is a positive return for the market in that year. That is an impressive statistic and shows that there is actually cycles operating in the marketplace. The tops of the peaks have a vastly superior statistical record that I would suggest is clear. This could also be because markets fall rapidly, normally twice as fast as they rise. The market also spends the majority of its time producing positive returns. 41 out of the 60 years were positive, averaging a gain of 14%, whereas 32% of the time we had losing years, averaging a loss of 12.66%. So the four year cycle troughs, which is essentially here, how accurate were they? At the bottom of the wave, the four year cycle predicted maximum market losses correctly, only 29% of the time. However, the S&P 500 made losses either in the exact year of the cycle bottom or the following year, 86% of the time. So how can we use this information? To conclude, the four year business cycle, we need to evaluate what we can do with it. I do not have a degree in mathematics. My degree is in business and finance. However, this particular piece of cycle analysis does tell me something. The peaks of the four year cycle have produced a 93% probability of a positive overall market return for the last 60 years. Be wary. You cannot use cycle analysis to place a trade on a stock, but you can allow it to place you on extra alert to protect your portfolio.